Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this very special edition of IAG Trade Talk. We're doing a special report today, and we're doing a, a deep dive into the long-awaited uh, Bergen Inquiry report. It's a very weighty tome, 750 pages. I've got it all printed out here, and a lot of people have been asking uh, for a summary of it, and uh, quite rightly, too. It's an absolutely fascinating report. It really offers a glimpse behind the curtain of the operations of uh, Crown Resorts and very worthy of a deep dive. So uh, for anybody that uh, doesn't know, Crown operates uh, Crown Melbourne, uh, which has been going now for 27 years. So a very established uh, casino operator. Uh, Crown Perth, uh, uh, Crown Aspinalls in London, and also has a 50% share in the Aspers Group, which has four casinos in the UK. But more importantly than any of that in terms of this re report for New South Wales, is that it operates uh, Crown Sydney at the uh, Barangaroo uh, site. So uh, that's actually been going since 2014. It received uh, a license to construct the casino and uh, it was ready to open in December. In fact, has opened, but only for non-gaming. No gaming yet at that uh, casino, essentially because of this report and what's come out of it. So let me give you a little bit of background about this report first. So uh, in... 2019 in May, uh, Melco Resorts and Entertainment announced that it would be acquiring 19.99% of Crown Resorts in two tranches, 9.99% and 10%. And it did go ahead and acquire the first tranche of 9.99%. Nine, uh, 9 but then in uh, July of 2019, there were some rather sensational media allegations in the Australian media a very big uh, cooperative effort between uh, Sydney Morning Herald and uh, Channel 9. And uh, those media allegations were quite quite extensive um, in relation to money laundering and junket associations and uh, pretty damning allegations. And the, um, the ILGA uh, report uh, basically came out, um, the uh, report uh, terms were to focus on uh, Melco's acquisition. And then the terms of the report, once uh, Melco later then decided uh, to drop its acquisition of uh, Crown Resorts, it didn't end up buying the second tranche and sold the first tranche to uh, the Blackstone Group. And then the terms of reference, so to speak, of the inquiry was changed to look at the suitability of uh, Crown to hold a, a, a casino license. So the report issued on the 9th of February, uh, about a week ago now, and the Commissioner Bergen's findings were absolutely scathing. I think there's no, there's no other way to put it, um, of Crown Resorts. Um, I've got a few notes here. She, um, uh, and I quote, said that there are present and very deep uh, corporate cultural problems within Crown. She was extremely critical of Crown's corporate governance. And she highlighted a number of um, very serious corporate failures by Crown. So many of you will remember Crown's misadventure in China, where 19 of their staff were arrested in um, 2016 uh, for promoting gambling in mainland China. She referred to likely money laundering through to two Crown subsidiary companies, South Bank and River Bank. She highlighted various uh, issues around relationships with junkets, and she also highlighted the fact that um, James Packer, formerly uh, chairman of Crown Resorts, but now simply a shareholder, uh, albeit the biggest shareholder, uh, was getting access to information that uh, perhaps other shareholders weren't getting by virtue of initially a service agreement with his company CPH, and then later uh, what was termed a controlling shareholder protocol, which essentially allowed James Packer to have pretty much carte blanche information within the company, within Crown, that other shareholders wouldn't get access to. Commissioner Bergen's uh, findings were that Crown is not a suitable person to hold a casino license in New South Wales, rather sensational finding for a company that's held a casino license in Victoria for 27 years. Um, and she offers a raft of suggestions on how Crown could cure itself, could repair itself to become suitable. And she also uh, has listed uh, a list of suggested regulatory changes to the regulation of casinos in New South Wales, uh, the main four of which are enhancements to prevent money laundering, uh, particularly in terms of 
uh, punters having to declare source of funds for la larger gamblers. She's suggesting that junkets should be completely uh, prohibited in New South Wales. She's suggesting that a separate regulator be established, the Independent Casino Commission, and that it have the powers of a standing royal commission, which in Australia are very, very extensive powers. And finally, that the ICC be required to uh, approve any transfer uh, of 10% or more um, equity holding in a license holder, a casino license holder in New South Wales. So to do a bit of a deep dive into this and to analyse uh, all the implications for Crown, uh, for casinos in Australia, and even for casinos all around the world, um, I, we're very lucky here at IAG to have two former regulators. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome David Green. David is principal of New Page uh, Consulting and was formerly chairman of the Independent Gambling Authority of South Australia. David lived in Macau for many years and assisted the Macau government uh, with the liberalisation of the gaming industry there and regulations in Macau. So, David, welcome to IAG. Hello, Andrew. Thank you. And we also have uh, uh, Peter Cohen. Peter is uh, Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Agenda Group and was formerly the uh, Executive Director and CEO of the Victorian uh, regulator, uh, then known as the VCGR. And I noticed, Peter, you get uh, a few mentions by name in the Bergen Report uh, for the work that you did in 2016 uh, uh, for New South Wales government on regulation of casinos. So welcome, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. So I'm just going to throw out a really broad question first. I mean, with all these scathing findings and, and, and criticisms of Crown, uh, can James Packer survive as a shareholder in Crown Resorts? Um, I think the first thing we should note is that James himself may not wish to survive as a shareholder. He's clearly shown in the last couple of years an interest in downsizing his shareholding probably to below 10% anyway. But let's look at the hypothetical as if he wishes to remain. Could he? Well, there are a number of findings in Bergen's report that need to be considered by any regulator that has to approve James as a, an associate of Crown. Um, and if he fails any of those, then he's no longer suitable. But I'm not convinced he does fail any of them. If we look at them one by one, there's the issue about whether he should have known that Stanley Ho was still associated with great respect and therefore should have been aware of that when he wanted to sell to Melco. To me, that's an understandable administrative slip. Stanley, as James probably would have known, was incapable of doing anything anyway uh, at the stage where this became an issue. As far as we can tell, he was bedridden with illness. And of course, he's passed away since then. Um, it's arguable that James might have thought that Victoria had approved Crown working with, was then PBL, working with Melco back in about 2006 or 2007 on the basis that Stanley Ho wasn't involved. In fact, that wasn't the case. Victoria just said that Stanley Ho did not have sufficient influence in Melco to be warrant of any in further investigation. So we never found Stanley to be suitable or unsuitable, but we certainly in Victoria didn't say that he was no longer involved with Melco, but it's possible that somebody thought he's just no longer involved. The second problem for James in, that comes out of the Bergen report is his relationship with the junket operators, where James, in his own evidence, said he met with a number of the junket operators, which have subsequently been considered to be linked to organised crime. Again, I don't think meeting with a few people is necessarily grounds for being unsuitable when those people have been allowed to continue to bring junket players to casinos. Um, Victoria has the opportunity to stop those junket operators and has chosen not to do so. So it's a bit hard to see that James is unsuitable just because he met with a few junket operators. The third issue, the one that got most attention in Bergen's report was the threat that he made to a private equity person who's since been named. Um, but James has never been charged with any offence there. He's not been charged with making threats to kill or anything of that nature. So it's not sure that that goes anywhere that makes him unsuitable. And the last one is the controlling shareholder protocol of the services agreement and whether or not that was inappropriate. It was probably inappropriate, but I think the problem there lies with the Crown directors, not with James. Anybody can ask for a, a protocol or an agreement or for information. It's the director's job not to give it to them if they're not giving it to all shareholders equally. So if I was, I'm a regulator and based solely on that information, and there might be more that I don't know about, I'm not sure I'd find James unsuitable at this stage to continue to be associated with Crown. 
let's talk about David. I'd like to go to you in a, in a second about the wider um, board. But let, let's you, you since you brought up uh, the incidents. I mean, let me just. I've made a few notes here of, from the report of comments that uh, Commissioner Bergen made on some of the directors, and just like to go to the board. So uh, James Packer, of course, who was not a director at the time. She described the incident that you referred to as shameful and disgraceful, uh, that he threatened, uh, and she used the word threatened, a private equity uh, firm businessman. Um, she, uh, Ken Barton, who we've uh, just this morning found out has resigned as CEO, her comment is the authority cannot have confidence in Mr. Barton as a director. Uh, Michael Johnston, uh, another director, he should conclude his tour of duty to enable the uh, authority to be comfortable the Crown is a suitable person, basically saying he should resign. Andrew Demetriou, her comment is, and I quote, the authority would be justified in lacking confidence in placing reliance upon Mr. Demetriou in, in the future. Harold Mitchell, she says, should reflect on the need to refresh the Crown Board and take steps to expedite the process. In other words, he's got to go. Uh, Jeff Dixon, uh, it's inexplicable that as chair of the Crown Risk Management Committee, Mr. Dixon had no inkling of the escalating risks in China. And, and at, at the risk of being repetitive, just two more, Robert Rankin, who was chairman from 2015 to 2017, uh, Bergen describes his reign as clearly lacklustre, refers to his apparent lack of skills, and his reaction to James Packer's actions, disgraceful actions as, and I quote, inexplicable and reflecting very badly on his character. Finally, John Alexander, obviously a very loyal Packer, a person over the years and who was chairman and CEO from 2017 till January 2020, she said Mr Alexander's stewardship, and I quote, led to disastrous consequences. There's not many people come out of this report unscathed. Perhaps Helen Coonan comes out not too bad. But um, David, can, can any of the board change? Does it need a complete, complete new broom? I think over time it needs a substantial change, Andrew. I'm not sure it needs uh, an entire purge of the board to improve it. Uh, you've got a couple of people on there, uh, in particular Antonio Cusanas, um, who is um, well equipped, I think, to meet the challenges of being a member of a board such as Crown. She has a background in the industry and understands regulation through a time with aristocrat and importantly with CFO of that organisation. So she comes to the table with something to add um, I think uh, in terms of the chair, um, certainly I would see her staying on in the short term, but I do think in the circumstances that we've been presented with, it would be appropriate for her to be thinking of moving on also. Um, there are several factors behind that. One is that she's got heavy commitments outside the Crown Board, and as of this morning, she is executive chairman of Crown. Now, that obviously ups the ante in terms of the investment she needs to make in terms of time and availability, and also uh, her ability to manage the complexities that have arisen because of this report. And that particularly means the relationship with the regulator in New South Wales, but it will also mean relations with uh, the New South Wales government and uh, possibly with other governments as well. Um, Victoria, as we know, is certainly looking into Crown again, um, given that uh, only a couple of years have elapsed since it last did its five yearly review. Um, and I suspect that she will really need to consider her position after say so six to 12 months have elapsed. Um, Harold Mitchell's position is interesting because he's chairman of the nominations committee at the moment. So bizarrely, perhaps given the commentary by the commissioner, uh, he's in charge of the process of finding candidates for the board. Now, I think it's common knowledge, certainly across the industry that the Board of Crown has always lacked some expertise and background in gaming. Um, the people that have had that expertise have either been executive employees on the board or they've been uh, associates of Mr. Packer through CPH. 
But in terms of independent directors with that sort of background and expertise, uh, really until Antonia Kazanis came along, I'm hard pressed to think of one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this uh, really emphasizes the importance of Nigel Morrison being nominated as a non-executive director. I think Nigel clearly adds uh, operational expertise. He adds multi-jurisdictional uh, experience. And uh, importantly, I think he's very accustomed to the demands of different regulatory environments. So he will be a positive acquisition, but the board is going to be gutted and uh, how it rebuilds, I think, the 63% of shareholders who aren't James Packer related at the moment are going to really want to see evidence that the key recommendations are picked up. And that means that there is some expertise beyond one independent board member in the gaming industry. I mean, it would be unfair for me not to mention that um, Commissioner Bergen was complimentary to a few of the board members. She, she, did, she did acknowledge the honesty in, in giving evidence of a few of them, but I noted that they tended to be the more, uh, the, the board members that would perhaps be a little bit more distant, less proximate to the day-to-day -day running of Crown. It seemed the, 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 the people, the senior executive, senior management, for example, and, and board members who were more proximate to the running of Crown, there was pretty much rounding criticism. And this leads to my next question, which is about within the industry, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. Um, there has been uh, the one word that gets associated with Crown a lot over the years is arrogance. And I note that that word is in Bergen's report. She, she mentions Crown's arrogance and their aggressive pursuit of Chinese VIPs. When uh, the issues came up in the South, with the South Korean casinos, when other, other, other operators that were pursuing VIP players in mainland China withdrew, Crown chose not to. They had a very aggressive program being headed up by, by Michael Chen. I mean, any comments from either of you on this sort of perception in the industry that Crown's been very aggressive in their pursuit of business and perhaps not uh, taken stock like they should have and thought about other stakeholders, thought primarily just about their bottom line and chase that as hard and as aggressively as they can? Well, if I could perhaps uh, venture some initial comments on that, um, I think the symbiosis between Crown and the Victorian government is almost legendary. And that hasn't happened by accident. It's happened by dint of tenure and monopoly. And a monopoly uh, is going to breed a number of things, um, potentially arrogance, um, but also uh, perhaps a disregard for embracing um, all of the nuances of the regulatory structure that might be imposed on the company. And it was quite successful in negotiating arrangements with Victoria that in hindsight, I'm sure would seem to be um, highly uh, beneficial to it. Um, and it, if you look at the process by which it actually obtained a license in New South Wales, it made uh, an unsolicited bid for that license. Now, as a general principle, if you're coming to request a privilege, which is the grant of a casino license, you come with clean hands. And I think um, it's now clear that if they had clean hands in 2014, uh, those hands were sullied somewhat in the ensuing years. So I think um, there is a degree of hubris associated with Crown, which um, I haven't personally seen with other operators in Australia. But if you go offshore, uh, it's not uncommon. Um, I think you would say that there was a degree of hubris associated with Wynn, for example. Um, and indeed the board in Wynn arguably failed to exercise appropriate control and uh, uh, implement appropriate safeguards over its CEO. So um, yes, I think in conclusion, it's pretty obvious that her finding in that regards well supported. 
Bit if I could um, go to you, I mean, just continuing on that theme, I mean, that kind of cosy relationship that uh, David referred to, it remind, the first thing that jumped into my mind was right back to the very beginning of Crown and the relationship between then Premier Jeff Kennett and Lloyd Williams. I mean, it's been a sort of historic all the way through. And you, you were the regulator uh, at v VCGR, so you know this company you know, very, very well. I mean, the same question to you and, and to continue on from that, what happens to Crown now? What happens to Crown in Melbourne? What happens to Crown in Sydney? What happens to Crown in Perth? What even happens to Crown in the UK? Um, to answer the second bit first, the Commission has made it quite clear there's a pathway for Crown to be suitable. Um, and it doesn't actually have to do a huge amount to get there. It, it has to change some personnel and the, what, the key ones have already gone. So that's Andrew Demetrio, Michael Johnson and now Ken Barton. They're the ones that were at clearly identified as having to go. Um, they have to show a, an understanding of better corporate governance. Ironically, Helen Coonan being executive chair is actually a backward step, but an understandable one in a temporary basis because regulators would prefer the chairman to be a non-executive position. Um, but for Ken Barton to leave, someone else has to run the company and the person that runs the company has to be someone who's already approved. You can't have somebody step in as CEO that's not approved by a regulator and any person that's coming in that hasn't previously been approved is probably going to have to wait three months to get that approval from four regulators. As a minimum, minimum of three months, I would have thought for someone that has no problems and has probably got a background in gaming, it's probably going to be at least three months. So you need someone to step in and the only real options were someone who's already an executive crown, at Crown who's already been approved as a close associate in the language of New South Wales or as a director. So I can understand why the chairman is all of a sudden executive commissioner, but in the, um, to make themselves suitable, they've really got to get an independent commissioner, which means going back to Helen Coonan as an independent commissioner and appointing a new CEO. And they chairman. have to show a new, so what was that, sorry? Chairman, I think you mean, not commissioner. Chairman, I do mean chairman. I apologize to both <laughs> Commissioner Bergen and <laughs> Ch Chairman Coonan. Um, the, um, they also need to show they understand compliance better. They need to establish a proper compliance framework. Um, the way I would recommend Crown does this, which is a bit different to what Commissioner Bergen has done, is get Crown to talk to the four regulators that need to approve them uh, and put in place a model that will work for all four. You don't want to have a model that works for three and not for one. Um, so you need to have a model. Now, it might be an independent compliance committee that reports directly to a non-executive chair, but whatever it is, it ought to be developed in conjunction with the four regulators to make sure it works to satisfy each of those regulators' needs. Um, they're the primary things. That the, the, There is, of course, the possibility that James Pack has to sell down his, his shares if any of the four regulators say that he's no longer suitable to be a, an associate of Crown. But even if that happens, I suspect they would be the regulators would give Packer time to reduce his shareholding. I don't think it will be an instant shareholding divestment requirement, that that would just be impractical. Yes, and the, the pool is somewhat uh, somewhat thinned with uh, Wynn Win already saying, no, I mean, I guess they could always come back. Melco out of the race. I mean, it, it, uh, at IAG, we wrote a story a little while ago postulating that, you know, Sands might be a fit, but there's not exactly a huge pool of companies around the world that would be perhaps interested in Crown right now. So, I mean, uh, you yeah, know, just expanding a little bit on that before moving on to implications outside of, of Crown for the wider industry. I mean, uh, so you feel Crown can reform itself, can reinvent itself, if and, even if that means uh, James Packer having to go down under 10% or complete divestiture, time would be time would be given. And what, uh, so, so long-term outlook for Crown then, uh, you know, we've got Helen Coonan obviously has jumped in uh, to become executive ch uh, chairman. There's really no choice for her. I mean, long-term outlook, are we looking at a, a, a new CEO in 12 months time and a, a totally new board over the next six to 12 months. Uh, I mean, David, do you have a view, view on uh, how they should go? Uh, yes, I, I, I do. Um, I'd just like to pick up on one uh, thing about Peter's comments, uh, which I think um, uh, came to notice for me, at least when I was playing my way through the report and it's to do with their approach to risk management. Um, what I think the commissioner found was that while they were very good at filling out a risk appetite statement, which theoretically complies with the requirements of uh, applicable risk management standards, 
um, there really wasn't much advertence to what that all meant in terms of uh, mitigation, controls and compliance. And uh, I think um, one of the reasons for that is that because of the presence on the board of CPH personnel, there tended to be an alignment in the way in which risk was evaluated between CPH and Crown, when in fact they were two entirely separate entities and businesses. Uh, now, having made that point, let me return to what you asked. Um, I think um, uh, certainly they will be on the hunt for a new CEO, and in fact, may already have begun that process. Uh, I would suspect that uh, the process was begun really when the inquiry wound up uh, with uh, its closure of hearings at the end of last year. So I don't think Crown will be as far behind the eight ball as perhaps they might have been had they only started last week when the report hit the deck. Um, the chair I've already commented about, uh, I know we're, we're not into ageism and uh, there's no limitation on age these days under the corporation's law for directors. But uh, getting a younger chairman with perhaps less commitments uh, and not uh, in any way involved in the problems that were identified, whether actively or passively, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. And I would think, uh, to go back to my comment before, six to 12 months would be a likely time frame to find that person. And then of course, to put them through the regulatory mill may take uh, three to six months more. Good. Oh, well, there's hope for me yet then. <laughs> um, uh, Andrew, I just wonder whether they've actually already identified their CEO and he's just been appointed to the board already. I, I, I don't know whether he wants exactly. it, but Nigel Morrison's been appointed to the board yet they couldn't possibly have said he was going to be the CEO while Ken Barton was still right. there. Um, I have no information, but he's clearly a person with the sort of skills that they ought to be looking for. He may yeah. not want the job. He might be quite happy to be a director, but clearly he's a possibility as a CEO as well. When he was appointed, it was the first thing that came to my head. I mean, of course, he did work for Crown right back at the very beginning of Crown. Yeah. That was a long, long time ago. Um, let's move on to the wider implications for the industry in um, Australia and Asia and the rest of the world. So starting, we'll start in New South Wales. So they've, the recommendation, uh, Commissioner Bergen's recommended a separate uh, independent casino commission to split away from the existing uh, authority. Um, does that really change anything or is it just a name change? Oh, I think it's a significant change. Um, the bit that's significant to me is not the independent bit, it's the casino commission being casino only. Um, the only place I can think of in the world right now that might have an a, a regulator that only does casinos is Jamaica, who has no casinos, um, but they've got a casino regulator. Um, Singapore has recently modified their regulator. They were sort of the holdout standalone casino regulator. They're now doing casinos and gaming. And there's a reason why people change to move away from casinos only, and that is to stop the regulator from being captured by the casino operator. Mm. Um, we had the problem in Victoria and we had to fix it. And that was done by consolidating casino and gaming together. So our casino and gaming inspectors weren't just doing casinos. Um, I, I think that's the risk in this model. Um, I know that the, the um, chairman of the Independent Liquor and Gaming Authority has talked about Crown having to blow itself up, or maybe somebody else said that, I can't recall, but having to blow itself up to start all over again. Well, it appears to be that's what the regulator is going to be doing in New South Wales. And whenever you have that sort of substantial change of regulators, you go through some very difficult times at, at, the, side, at the end of the regulator, which then makes life difficult for the industry whilst they wait for the new regulator to be reformed. You're going to have changes in personnel, changes in culture, changes in policies, and it all takes time. And I think you'll see something similar happen in Victoria as well. I think the Victorian regulator will also be, I'm just guessing, but let's use the language, get blown up as well, I think, and be reformed in some form. But if I were doing it, I wouldn't be having a casino only regulator. Um, the independence issue, I think, is a bit overstated or misunderstood, perhaps, might be the right expression. Um, gaming regulators, as far as I've known in Australia, have always acted 
independently, making decisions independently of any government interest. When I was at the Victorian Commission for Gaming Regulation, the predecessor for the current organisation, I was the CEO there for eight years. I never had anyone from government, whether it was a minister or a ministerial advisor or anyone from the minister's office, asking me to make a particular decision, um, either to grant a licence or to take disciplinary action or approve a new game or rule. Never did they intervene. So I think regulators always make independent decisions. The question about independence is really who's setting the policy that the regulator has to um, regulate. And, and I'm a little unclear on the commissioner's model about who's doing that. Um, it, to my way of thinking, policy should be left with government and the regulator can't be fully independent because it should be regulating the government's policy. Can, can I just add there, um, and I certainly agree with what Peter said, uh, there's also a question of independence of sources of funds because what uh, Bergen is contemplating is the possibility that, that these might have to be full-time commissioners. And one way to choke off a regulator, of course, is for government to starve it of funds. And uh, it's not unheard of for governments to do that. In fact, state governments in Australia are notorious for saying do more with less. And if that should be uh, a continuing break on the ability of an organisation like an IWC to function effectively, then the independence element becomes quite important. It needs to have funding. Um, the model that the Commission is suggesting, uh, which hypothecates funds uh, from other sources, licensing fees, compliance, uh, oversight, and so on, uh, is one, in fact, which Singapore has used. And uh, I suspect it's a model which does provide some real separation between government and the regulator because the government can't show its displeasure by simply cutting a budget. There is a problem, though, with that hypothecation of funds, apart from the fact that treasuries around the country do not like hypothecation. And that the, the problem is the, the potential argument that the regulator is only finding someone because I need the money. So they're taking disciplinary action against a casino operator or if it's a more global regulator, they're doing it because they need the, they need the money. And that, to me, is a huge problem. It's never troubled the casino control people in New Jersey. No, but it might, it might trouble some other people in Victoria who monitor what happens with the regulator. Look, it, it may do, Peter. I, I think uh, that's very true. But uh, I think we both know through our own experience that having a, access to a pipeline of funds which government can't turn the spigot on and off on um, is actually quite important. It does raise the question, of course, if you have a truly compliant industry... Um, where are they going to get the money from? The regulator. Well, that's true. Um, that's when you've got to look at some sort of overlay as a super supervision charge. Mm. Um, that's possible. I mean, there's no reason the industry shouldn't pay for its own regulation. Yeah, and supervision charges have been used in Victoria. They've been used for many years for the gaming operator model at Tats and Tab Court ran poker machines in Victoria. In the early days of the casino in Victoria, there was a supervision charge. It was replaced um, very early days in about 1996. Um, it was removed rather, but at the time it was removed, it was replaced with a increase in tax. So the government in the end actually won out because Crown did so well, they got more out of the increased tax than they ever would have out of a supervision charge. Yeah, but that money went to the government, didn't go to the regulator. The interesting thing was uh, New Zealand, um, New Zealand had quite an unusual model. What they used to do when they had a casino control authority uh, uh, as regulator, which is, I think, pre-2003, was that the um, regulator would prepare a budget and deliver that budget to its licensees and require them to contribute on a pro rata basis. And uh, that went on until the disestablishment of the authority in 2003. Um, and it's the only authority I'm aware of that was ever funded that way. Um, was it killed by regulatory capture? I don't know the answer to that, but uh, 
certainly it, it did raise questions as to why New Zealand had gone that way when no one else had. Mm. It's very interesting. The ILGA is being put in a position to uh, approve uh, destroying itself, basically. So that's quite quite an interesting situation that they have to face. I, I want to move on to the recommendation about junkets. Uh, uh, the commissioner has suggested that there be no junkets in New South Wales at all. In, um, given the nature of gaming in Australasia, and given the, the you know, importance of junkets, which sure is reduced a little bit, but they're still an important part of the industry. What implications? does that have for, first of all, Crown Sydney, which of course was meant to be a VIP casino, and then the wider industry in Australia? Well, I think you'd say that Crown has done a magnificent job of building for a market that may no longer exist. Um, that is a risk, obviously, with uh, a prohibition on uh, junkets. But one has to be careful about how you define what a junket is. Um, and there are numerous definitions, whether it's international marketing agent definition in Singapore, um, a uh, representative uh, uh, as it is in Nevada, uh, or a junket as it is in Macau. And there is uh, some emotive um, implication associated with the use of the term. But I think if there was a situation where the power to extend credit uh, firstly was removed completely from the equation so that uh, these junket operators could not be in the position of extending credit, um, not in their own right and preferably not as agents of the casino either, because I think that muddies the water somewhat, uh, particularly when it comes to IML compliance. Um, so, yes, I, I think um, a prohibition on junket operators would be tough and difficult, but would it entirely eliminate the top end of the market? Uh, what it may do, of course, is just increase the emphasis on direct marketing. Uh, player rebates, player um, commissions given directly to players who are induced to play in the casino by the casino itself. But I'm, just thinking, I'm just thinking about the situation with Crown Sydney in particular at first. I mean, they obviously were very heavily reliant on junkets. They become a VIP casino. Now junkets are, pro are prohibited. They can't do that. So the, so the immediate thought is, all right, we'll premium direct. But isn't that what got them into trouble in China, going direct? So it puts them in a very awkward, they've just spent $2 billion on a six star magnificent property, which I'm, I haven't been there myself yet, but I'm told is mag magnificent and they may not really have a viable business. A am I right? Well, you're right, but um, whether it's premium direct or junket, if it's China facing at the moment, it's history. Um, and uh, you know, the blacklisting that's going on in China the crackdown on uh, the encouragement of uh, um, players from mainland China to, to entertain uh, offshore gambling tourism. Um, it's really a, a factor that is outside the control and purview of the operators themselves. Um, they're going to have to look elsewhere, I suspect, for that business. And there's plenty of elsewheres in Asia. You know, there's potentially large markets in places like India, uh, in Thailand, in Indonesia. Now, some of these source markets are already uh, being um, tapped for uh, the provision of players into Australia, but I suspect they're just going to have to do it uh, more intensively than perhaps they anticipated. Eddie, do you have a view on that? Well, I don't think Commissioner Burke and banning or recommending a banning of junkets would make much difference because I think the junket model seems to be dying anyway. Um, so even if the government does not ban junkets in New South Wales, it, the industry itself is changing. Um, generally speaking, Chinese travel is shifting towards the free and independent traveller model anyway, overall, and that would be the marketplace for future gamblers. Now, the ones that come to Sydney or Melbourne or anywhere else on the basis of wanting to come on their own, under their own steam, 
um, would be um, looked at as potential gamblers rather than trying to get them packaged together and under a junket. I, I think the junket model was not going to continue anyway, irrespective of whether it's banned or not banned. It's not helped as a model by the fact that the biggest junket operator has its own casinos and therefore more likely to want to take players to its own casinos than to someone else's anyway. So I think the junket model was sort of dying a slow death and this might have just hastened it a bit. A broader, I mean, just to finish up a, a broader question for, for either of you. I mean, wider implications for the industry as a whole in Australia and the, and the rest of the world. Australia, uh, rightly or wrongly, is perceived as a, uh, a sort of a forward jurisdiction that should be looked at by other jurisdictions around the world and uh, you know, perhaps emulated. So this may well have more of a voice than it might be if it had been in a different jurisdiction. There are some interesting um, recommendations in here. For example, the, the source of funds, a declared source of funds declaration. Are we going to see this spread throughout the, the casino uh, universe and become a uh, become something that's going to be required uh, by regulators? Or, or any other thoughts of wider implications you think that uh, might come uh, as a result of uh, a Commissioner Bergen's report? The source of funds one is an interesting proposal because it's effectively asking casino regulation to get into the space of a different regulator altogether, which is in Australia's case, Austrac. Um, yeah. Now, when I was a regulator, I was always in favor of not getting in the other regulator's way and leaving it, and also really not second guessing what another regulator is doing. That just leads to all sorts of problems. I think a better path to follow for Australia would be to actually improve the relationship between Austrac and the state based gaming regulators. There is no relationship and that needs to fix. That has been a huge problem for many, many years. The lack of information sharing between a casino operator, a Austra Austrac and the gaming regulator. And that needs to be fixed. I, I would worry about fixing that first before I worry about the source of funds declaration statements. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, is also referenced in the report that um, uh, will occur is uh, card-based cashless gaming. Um, I think uh, there are quite a number of aspects to that which make it attractive. Uh, firstly, it's going to provide information that currently can only be collected probably if a suspicious transaction report is going to be generated, which is, uh, if you like, advanced due diligence or know your customer. Uh, if that's done in advance as a precondition to the issuing of cards, and cards are the only way in which you can participate in games in the casino, uh, it's going to eliminate or at least mitigate some of those concerns about uh, the various techniques that people are using to uh, currently uh, defeat cash controls. Uh, but also it has the advantage of uh, from uh, the concern sector point of view, that if patrons are going to be barred, if a card can be cancelled, you can deny access to a player to a gaming establishment through the endorsement of the card. So it doesn't require investment in uh, systems to try and find disguised barred players. It doesn't uh, put the casino in jeopardy because those people find their way into the casino. And I think there are sufficient benefits associated with it, apart from eliminating pilfering and people stealing uh, um, tickets from machines and so forth. It's going to considerably streamline the administration of AML law in a casino. Well, very good. Well, uh, we're out of time. So thank you uh, uh, both. And uh, it's an absolutely fascinating report uh, to you uh, at home. It's publicly available online. So if you want to uh, wade your way through, once again, this, this weighty time, you can. And it does offer some really, really fascinating insights to the industry. So uh, Dave and Peter, thanks for being at IAG and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Pleasure.